As we move from gathering to listening, our scripture reading today is from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Natalie. Well, good morning, Antioch. Good to be with you this morning. My name's Rick, and I'm one of the elders here. Today is the third Sunday of Harvest, and we're in the third week of a vision series entitled The Whole Gospel, Both and Faith in an Either-Or World. I can't tell you how excited I am and how significant I think this series is. I'd encourage you to be sure to catch every one of these sermons, either in person or uh, by recording. Uh, that doesn't mean I want you to go home now and catch up and walk out on me this morning. but. <laughs> But I truly believe that this series can be transformative, both for us as individuals and collectively in our faith and discipleship. Today's topic is the whole truth of scripture, human authorship and divine authority. We'll be affirming the inspiration and authority of the Bible and discussing the way the scriptures were originally produced and how best to understand the idea that the Holy Spirit of God was involved without overwhelming the uh, human authors and their personalities and experiences. And we'll look a little bit at how overemphasis of either the divine authority on the evangelical side or the human authorship on the mainland, mainline Protestant side can lead us astray when it comes to understanding God and his purposes in the world and in our lives. In this series on the whole gospel, most of the topics we face involve false dichotomies. Christians have tended to choose, for example, whether to believe and teach the gospel of Jesus, what Jesus himself taught, or the gospel about Jesus, what the apostles subsequently taught about the purpose and meaning of Jesus' life and death. And as Pete showed us last week, the two are not mutually exclusive. They don't even appear to contradict one another, and there's no reason to choose between the two and every reason to proclaim and live out both. And the same is true of most of the other issues we will address in this series. They're simply false dichotomies. But may I suggest that today's topic, and I believe just one or two of the others, involves a paradox. And when introducing the concept of paradox, I can do no better than pointing you to Gilbert and Sullivan's fun-loving musical, The Pirates of Penzance. In the second act, we find the song, When You Had Left Our Pirate Fold, whose chorus goes like this. A paradox, a paradox, a most ingenious paradox. Ha, 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 <laughs> this paradox. The plot, as you all know well, turns upon both a paradox and a misunderstanding. The misunderstanding is this. As Frederick's mother is dying, she requests his nurse to apprentice him to learn to be a pilot, meaning the pilot of a ship. But what the nurse hears is pirate. And so he spends his youth aboard a pirate ship learning the ways of a very musical band of buccaneers. The paradox is this. Frederick's contract for his apprenticeship frees him from the pirates on his 21st birthday. But he was born on February 29th, which comes around only every four years. So although he has lived 21 years, he has only experienced five birthdays. A a paradox is an apparent contradiction, usually a pair of statements or beliefs that seem to be logically inconsistent with one another, but which in fact are not. Here's an example from science, the oxygen ultraviolet paradox. Science textbooks still talk about the Miller-Urey experiment of the 1950s, in which Miller briefly produced a smattering of amino acids in an effort to explain how chemical evolution could have led to the building blocks of life. We now know that the conditions under which the experiment was performed were inaccurate to the early Earth. Miller carefully kept oxygen away from the experimental apparatus because he knew that the building blocks of life cannot be produced in the presence of free oxygen. 
But in the absence of oxygen on the early Earth, there would have been no ozone layer and harmful ultraviolet radiation would have immediately destroyed any building blocks of life as soon as they formed. The chemical evolution of life's building blocks cannot take place either in the absence or in the presence of oxygen. In this case, the paradox cannot be resolved except by recognition that the starting assumption that life evolved gradually with, and without God's intervention is wrong. The oxygen UV paradox therefore provides further support for the idea that first and simplest life was a miracle and that DNA, proteins, and such cannot be produced except within a fully viable functioning living cell. Okay, that's your science for the day. <laughs> There'll be a little survey on your way out as to whether you found the science illustration or the Pirates of Penzance illustration <laughs> more helpful. Now back to the main point. The Bible and Christian faith include a number of paradoxes. We affirm, for example, that God is three and that God is one. And it takes a further bit of digging and ex explanation to resolve these two seemingly contradictory ideas. This particular paradox has been a stumbling block over the centuries for Jews and Muslims, among others. Likewise, we confess that Jesus is fully human and fully divine at the same time. I won't go into any detail on that because sometime in the next few weeks, Sean or someone even brighter will make that one, <laughs> will make that one the focus of one of these sermons. Here's a paradox that has divided Christendom throughout the centuries and not across the conservative liberal spectrum of these other topics. The camp that came to be known as Calvinism asserts vigorously that God is completely sovereign over all that occurs, including over which human beings are elect and therefore enter Christ's kingdom. Whereas the Arminian camp just as vigorously asserts the truth of human free will and responsibility, including regarding each person's individual salvation. And without getting into the weeds of where each of these views might tend to go too far in support of their position, the relevant point this morning is that the Bible teaches both God's sovereignty and human free will and responsibility. So this constitutes another paradox. In addition, in some biblical and Christian paradoxes, there remains, at the end of the day, mystery. And we cannot fully comprehend or explain everything there is to know about the resolution of them. This is okay because we also affirm a God who is beyond our comprehension. As God himself declared through the prophet Isaiah, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. To put it another way, if we have our theology too finely tuned, bundled up and impregnable, then we've likely created God in our own image rather than accepted his own self-revelation. A wise messianic Jewish lady friend of mine tells me that the idea of having a complete systematic theology, a concept treasured by we Western Christians, is completely foreign to the Jewish mind, which instead allows God to be God, even when that leaves a lot of room for mystery and incomprehension. Returning to the issue before us today, it seems contradictory to say that what we have in the Bible is the Word of God and, at the same time, the writings of nearly 40 different human authors. <clears throat> but this is and always has been the Christian belief, and it was certainly the belief of all the writers of Scripture themselves. And so we here at Antioch affirm with that vast cloud of witnesses both the human agency in the writing of the Bible and the divine authority of scripture. We uphold the doctrines of the inspiration and authority of the Bible, believing it to be the very word of God. And we believe that the individual human authors, their contexts, personalities, and experiences matter to our proper understanding of their words. And we do our best to keep these two, the divine authority and the human authorship, in their proper balance. A minute ago, as I introduced the quote from Isaiah, the words I used were, as God himself declared through the prophet Isaiah. And this would be a variation of the formula that we should always have in mind. I know brothers and sisters who almost never say, Paul wrote to the Colossians, or as David said in the 23rd Psalm. Instead, they would always and invariably say, the word of God says. <clears throat> 
and that's okay. But, he, but if at Antioch we tend to say, in his gospel account, Luke wrote, or something like that, we're never intending to ignore or downplay the fact that the Holy Spirit was inspiring Luke. Instead, our both and faith affirms with Jews and Christians throughout the ages that what the human authors of the Bible wrote was exactly what God wanted them to write. So let's look briefly at where we receive this understanding by examining some of the scriptures and what they have to say about themselves. And let's start with a passage in which Jesus himself offers us this same formula. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. The primary point of this passage is Jesus' own understanding of his identity as David's eternal Lord. But the point for us this morning is how Jesus understood this psalm, which is as the product of David writing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the consistent understanding of the writers of the New Testament with regard to the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, 2 Peter 2, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this represents Peter's articulation of the both and nature of the scripture writing process. Now let's turn to the passage that Natalie read for us this morning. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, collecting, I'm sorry, correcting and training in righteousness. I needed to correct myself there. <laughs> so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This passage is probably the clearest statement of the doctrine of the inspiration of scripture, the involvement of God's spirit in the writing of the Bible. It's referring specifically to what we call the Old Testament because at the time Paul wrote these words to Timothy, the scriptures were limited to the Hebrew Torah, wisdom literature, and the writings of the prophets. But as we'll see in a minute, <clears throat> this understanding of what constitutes the scripture was also being extended to include the writings of the apostles and what we, call, what we now call the New Testament. All the evidence available to us confirms that there was a monolithic understanding among the Jews that the Hebrew scriptures were the writings of men that were inspired by God, that they were the very word of God recorded through the agency of human beings. And the patriarchs, kings, judges, and prophets themselves reflected that same understanding. And their writings are filled with phrases like, thus says the Lord, or the Lord instructed me to write these words, or the equivalent. At any rate, we see in 2 Timothy 3.16 that the purpose of God's inspiring these writings includes teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. And if we back up to the preceding verses, we find that the scriptures also are able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Here Paul makes mention of two different things. One, what Timothy was taught about Jesus and his kingdom by his mother and grandmother. And second, how the Hebrew scriptures that he knew well from childhood also pointed ahead to the gospel of salvation in Christ. But as I suggested, we can also see hints that the apostles involved in the writing of the New Testament also recognized that what they were writing was God's inspired word as well. Here's an example from 2 Peter, so Peter writing. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. So here, Peter demonstrates awareness of Paul's letters, declares that they are written with the wisdom of God, and equates them with the other scriptures. 
Paul similarly refers to Luke's gospel as scripture. In 1 Timothy 5.18, for scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. So he quotes two passages here. The first, do not muzzle an ox, comes from Deuteronomy 25.4, the Hebrew scriptures. But the second, the worker deserves his wages, comes from Luke 10.7 and is a quotation of Jesus. According to Paul here, Luke's gospel is scripture on the same level as the Hebrew scriptures. And John and Luke and the other New Testament writers all share this understanding of what they were doing as writing the very word of God under the inspiration of God's own Holy Spirit. And this situation was prophesied by Jesus himself as recorded in John 14, 26. But the advocate, this is Jesus speaking, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Here Jesus is recorded as promising the disciples that the Holy Spirit would empower them to remember and record without error all that Jesus had said. And we could go on and on looking at passages that help lay out this paradoxical doctrine of the simultaneous human authorship and divine authority of the scriptures. And so far, all we've talked about is the result, the fact that the words of the Bible written by humans are nonetheless the words of God. Now I want to briefly mention the process. Among evangelicals who tend to emphasize the divine aspect of the Bible, the tendency is to envision a process of dictation, whereby God tells the human author exactly what to write, and he writes it. Where this does occur, it is often obvious. In Isaiah 38, for example, we read, Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, Go and tell Hezekiah, This is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. In the book of Revelation, John saw the risen Lord in a vision, and Jesus spoke to him, saying, To the angel of the church at Ephesus, write. And that's what John wrote. These are clear examples of dictation. But in the majority of cases, this is not what was going on when the scriptures were written. Probably on the other end of the spectrum is Luke's case. Writing about his process, Luke begins his gospel by saying, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. This would seem to be far from the process of dictation that we saw at work a minute ago. Apparently, Luke used the ordinary methods of journalism, questioning eyewitnesses and gathering all of the relevant information that would allow him to write an accurate account of Jesus' life and teachings. And so here's where we probably have to be content with a bit of mystery. Scripture doesn't tell us how the process took place in most cases. And we can only affirm with the writer of Hebrews that, quote, God spoke to our fathers in many and various ways. We'll come back to the mystery at the end of uh, the sermon. Okay, so far we've been trying to lay out the case for the both and nature of this topic. Now I want to look at the problems associated with either-or thinking on this subject. And I should start by saying that most of the church, there's a large part in the middle of the church which would affirm both the human authorship and the divine authority. So I'm really talking about the extremes. I'm going to focus on the extremes describing how emphasizing either half to the ignoring of the other can lead to error. Again, this will involve generalizations and are not meant as an indictment of any individual or group, but you may nonetheless recognize what I'm talking about. On the evangelical side, the great strength is the insistence that the scriptures are indeed the very word of God. But the first problem I want to call out is what I'll call verse picking, and I'll let Christian apologist Greg Kokel describe it. Evangelicals have developed a dangerous habit of looking for verses or isolated phrases in the Bibles that they think the Spirit impresses on them with personal messages foreign to the original context. Experiences like these are powerful but problematic. He goes on to say, the Bible itself teaches that God chose specific words meant to communicate precise meanings. 
looking for private messages in passages originally intended to mean something else interferes with that divine intent. Instead, the Bible tells us to study to get the correct sense of a passage. Then we are to guard and protect that truth from distortion and abuse. Kokel's own remedy for this problem is simply never read a Bible verse. By this, he means that in order to make sure you have the context and therefore the meaning of a verse right, you need to read at least the entire paragraph, if not the whole chapter or more. Let me give you one example. <clears throat> the entire Left Behind series of books and movies that sprung out of evangelicalism in the late 20th century came about by lifting a verse out of its context in order to make it say the opposite of what it really says. This recent misinterpretation takes its title from the words of Jesus in four verses in two pages, two passages, Matthew 24, 40 and 41, and Luke 17, 34 and 35. It promotes the rapture, an idea that arose in the 19th century that says that when Jesus returns at the end of this age, it is to take his followers away to heaven. According to this view, we don't want to be the ones left behind on earth. But reading the entire paragraph in either passage where he used these words, left behind, Jesus makes it clear that he is saying that those taken away are taken to judgment and those left behind will be saved to participate in his forever kingdom here on the renewed earth. Associated with this problem is another dangerous one, and that's biblicism. It's reflected in the bumper sticker, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Biblicism is the claim that the only things that we can know for sure are what the Bible tells us. And there are at least three problems with it. First, biblicism is self-refuting. That is, the claim itself falsifies itself. So here's a silly example of a self-refuting statement. <clears throat> there are no sentences in English of more than three words. This statement fails its own test. It is self-referentially absurd. Here's a more serious one that we commonly hear in our scientific age. The only way of truly knowing something is through scientific testing. This is an attempt to artificially narrow uh, what counts as knowledge, thereby eliminating such things as revelation or faith. But it too is self-refuting because there is no scientific experiment that can yield the conclusion that the only way of truly knowing something is through scientific testing, okay? <laughs> Biblicism suffers the same fate. If the claim of Biblicism were true, it would have to come from scripture, but there is no passage of scripture that makes such a claim. Secondly, and instead, we find in scripture many appeals or even mandates telling us to search for and find truth in history, nature, reason, our own conscience, and through other avenues. The clearest appeals to nature as a guide to knowing God are found in Psalm 19 and Romans 1, the latter of which tells us that all people know from the evidence of the creation itself that there is a God, though many choose to re reject that knowledge. Thirdly, one cannot begin to understand scripture without bringing to it an entire range of knowledge gained from outside of scripture. This includes such things as vocabulary and grammar, the laws of logic, and such. Like scientism, biblicism is an attempt to artificially discount other routes to knowledge. In modern evangelicalism, biblicism is a favorite ploy of young earth creation organizations, and any time you hear an appeal to biblicism or to scientism, you can feel pretty certain that the interpretation being defended cannot stand up to scrutiny. Closely associated with Biblicism is the tendency to act as though the Bible were written in English and directly for 21st century Christians. This can lead to sloppy interpretation that ignores the original language, culture, history, and experiences essential to the proper reading. Accurate understanding of what the Bible has to say to us depends upon rightly recognizing the various genres in which it is written. We get into trouble very quickly, for example, if we treat a proverb as a promise. Here's Proverb 22.6. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will turn from it. Many evangelical parents have claimed this as a promise from God, 
only to find that one of their teenage or adult children does in fact turn from the faith and morality of their parents. Has God failed them? Has he failed to carry out his promise here? Well, no, and that's because this is not a promise, but a proverb. Not an unfailing law, but a bit of wisdom that we would do well to follow. But in addition to genre, historical context matters, and a knowledge of Greek and Hebrew are helpful. This is not to say that you need to be a scholar in Greek and Hebrew to understand a given passage, but it is certainly important to seek out from time to time a brother or sister who is familiar with these ancient languages when wrestling with a difficult portion of scripture. <clears throat> Let me give you just a, quick, a couple of quick examples, and these come from the key passage for this morning. Here it is again. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. In English, there are two different words that are used to translate the single Greek word dikaiosune. One is righteousness, as found here in this verse. And when we think of righteousness, we usually have in mind personal, individual moral purity, but the scriptures rarely have that meaning in mind. The other word used to translate this word is justice, which we understand to mean right relationship with others. The scriptures usually have something more like this in mind, and justice is probably the better translation for this passage. But in actuality, we should understand this Greek word dikaiosune to mean something much more like the Hebrew word shalom. Paul is not here telling us that the scriptures can train us merely toward personal moral purity, but to reconciliation in all spheres and to right relationship with God, self, others, and the rest of creation. Here, failure to dig into the original language will leave us with rather too tepid an understanding of what God really has in store for us. Moving on in that same verse, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's look at the word here translated servant. It is the Greek word anthropos, and it doesn't mean servant. <laughs> As with all Greek nouns, anthropos is gendered, and it happens to be a masculine noun. But this does not mean that it only refers to male persons. But because it is a masculine noun, and because it makes for a smoother reading, the NIV, until very recently, and many other English translations still today, have translated it in this passage and elsewhere as simply man, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That translation wrongly implies that female disciples are not in view here. A truer translation would be so that the human being of God or so that the individual of God uh, would be equipped for every good work. But the translation here, the servant of God, is a great improvement upon the old rendering of man, even though it loses a little bit in terms of exact word-for-word -word translation of the Greek. Let me turn now to the mainline Protestant side where the danger is overemphasis of the human authorship of the scriptures. Again, speaking in generalities, the mainline Protestant believer is much more likely to pay attention to all of the considerations I've been talking about that are associated with the human authorship of the Bible. Things like genre, historical context, the original language and such. And all this is good. But let me identify two problems, or rather two levels of the same problem, that can result from an overemphasis on the human authorship and an underemphasis of the divine authority of Scripture. And while this won't take as long, the problem can be even more dire in its consequences. On one level, careful study of the Bible that pays close attention to genre, language, historical context, and such can lead to a place where the student of the Bible is involved in nothing more than an academic exercise. He may come to forget or disregard the important fact that what he is studying is the very word of God, the self-revelation of the almighty God of the universe through humans to humans. It's a case of not seeing the forest for the trees. In focusing on the details and the minutia, important as they may be to grasping a proper understanding, it can be easy to miss the opportunity to commune with the divine author even while pouring intensely over the love letter he has written to us. But there is another and even more dangerous level of this same problem. Becoming too absorbed in the details of the human authorship can lead to complete rejection of the divine authority of scripture. 
As strange as it may sound to some of us, a 2020 Barna survey found that 25% of Christians no longer believe that the Bible is the word of God or that it is reliable and trustworthy. It's tempting to call this a slippery slope, but I suspect that it's more accurate to see it as a steep precipice or cliff. Because God chose to reveal himself to us through human language and human authors with all their frailties, and because the copying, preserving, and translation of scripture also has involved humans at every step of the way, there can be a temptation to focus too closely on this aspect of this mysterious process and arrive at the conclusion that God was not involved at all. From doubting God's involvement in the writing of the Bible, to doubting God's involvement in creation itself, to doubting God's very existence, is a rather easy series of steps. So here at Antioch, we are committed to affirming, both in our proclamation and by our practice, both the human authorship and the divine authority of the scriptures, the word of God. And although everything we have discussed this morning has focused on the giving and receiving of this great gift, we likewise affirm both the human and divine aspect to the unwrapping of it. This is another sermon altogether, but we also approach Bible reading as a collaborative enterprise between our human selves and the Holy Spirit of God. And so each time we open the scriptures, we should be asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate them for us, to teach us a deeper understanding, even of words that we've read innumerable times, and to change our hearts and minds wherever such change is still needed as we engage with his word. I've suggested that we must be content with accepting that there is mystery in the process of getting God's word to us. And yet, perhaps it's not such a great mystery after all. Isn't life, with both its material and immaterial aspects, a greater mystery? The historical Christian understanding, and this about something for which the naturalist scientist has absolutely no explanation, is that at conception, not only does a new physical life begin to form, but that new living creature is simultaneously imbued with soul, spirit, conscience, and all of the other mental and immaterial components that make up human life. One of my favorite lines from Christian songwriter Rich Mullins is this, we are frail, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, forged in the fires of human passion, choking on the fumes of selfish rage. The first line proclaims God's involvement, while the rest acknowledges the specifically human act that goes to creating a new human life. It may only take two to tango, but it takes God's contribution to bring about the miracle of life. Then again, the creator of the universe has con condescended to give humans charge over the rest of creation. How mysterious is that? In Psalm 8, the shepherd astronomer David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, reminds us of this willingness on God's part to use us humans to accomplish his will for creation. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. And then, what about the incarnation? The paradoxical nature of the writing of scripture seems a little less mysterious when compared to the fact that the God of the universe became a human being in order, in part, to communicate to us what God is like. And consider this, whenever God chooses to communicate to humans, it necessarily involves his condescending to use human language and human speech. And often he uses the voices of other humans, whether prophets or wise mentors. Maybe your homework assignment should be to spend a half hour thinking about how and in what language the Father speaks to the Son through all eternity. What language the Holy Spirit uses when in instructing the angels, or how Christ communicates to the birds, the waters of the ocean, or the whales that sport within them. The point is that while there remains mystery in the simultaneous divine and human authorship of the Bible, there are other mysteries even greater that we must accept when in the presence of an uncreated, everlasting, almighty God.